I'm in Inglewood, living off Arbavita. I'm on government assistance, and I run out of money, and I have to buy Pampers for Jelani. And I had $11.42 in the bank. And I remember wrapping my son in a towel for two days. I remember the second day, like you said, I had my, my hand on Jelani's stomach, and I said, don't worry, baby. Mommy will never be this broke or broken again. What you're passionate about, your conviction, and your convenience don't live on the same block. So if you want to have a conviction for something, you have to sign up. Sign up to be inconvenienced. The one thing we have to constantly remind ourselves is to create micro wins to get to our macro wins. That we go after the macro win, but we only look at the macro win. I want you to look at the micro wins and get five micro wins under your belt so you can create your macro wins. I want to be liked. Well, I woke up and I like myself today, so your like is extra. My job is to like me first. I was willing to say every day, Lisa, you like you? Lisa, are you proud of you? Lisa, are you playing full out? Every day before I checked in with anybody else. The prescription for radical success is action. The difference between you and the person living their dreams that you're watching is simply the amount of action. It's not the hookup, it's not the family they were born into, it's not the gender, it's not the culture. Those are all great stories that we give. But it really is the things they did and how much they were willing to do. The reason why a lot of people won't become who they want is because they're too attached to who they've been. See, another reason why people won't get there is because the doorway is for you to fit through. You're trying to carry everybody else through because you're trying to be rescued 911 and you gotta rescue you first. I am much more valuable to my family and to my community because I was willing to let them go. Go through the door myself, teach myself, learn myself, condition myself, and then come back and get them. Cognitive dissonance is the form of discomfort that you put yourself in when you think of yourself in such a way that doesn't match your current behavior. Your mind will be uncomfortable because it doesn't match. So your mind will begin to call you to do the thing to make your mental conversation match your behavior. But there's a calling on your life that you don't get to shake. And it's only yours. No one else has the same calling as you. You want to go somewhere you've never gone? You got to do something you've never done. You got to say something you've never said. You gotta go to a place in you that you've never even been. You're not sentenced to this life this way. You chose it. If you wake up every day and say, I have nothing to protect, I have nothing to prove, I have nothing to hide, I have nothing to defend. Now, who do I choose to be? See, we're not supposed to tuck our dreams in on, on the pillow when we get up in the morning. We're not supposed to leave them at home not supposed to do that. That's not what we're wired to do. That's not who we are. Your human spirit doesn't care about the economy. The human spirit doesn't care that my son's father went to prison. My, the human spirit doesn't care what's happened to your family. The human spirit doesn't care about the past that you may have been molested or your family may have been broke or, or you may have been betrayed or you may have a divorce. Your human spirit doesn't care about any of that. Your human spirit simply says, what's our command for tomorrow? Comparison is and will always be the thief of all joy. And so when you begin to look at people, look at someone as a model of who you can be by taking a piece of who they are, adding it to the uniqueness of who you are. What do you need to do more of? Who do you need to be more of? What do you need to evict from your behavior? You're at the edge watching someone else live, wondering what it's gonna be like when you jump without ever jumping. And I'm just here to tell you, jump.
Fear is an emotion like any other emotion. Fear is an emotion like love, like compassion. Fear is an emotion, we just gave it more power. Fear reminds you that you have not arrived at the top of the mountain, that you are still climbing with the rest of us. Fear no longer becomes your fortress. Fear becomes your fuel. Fear is not your enemy. Fear is your friend. So however you step, just step. However you step, just step. Sometimes you gotta step out of something before you're stepping into something. I'd rather you take 10 steps wrong than analyze trying to make one step right one more day while someone's waiting to be inspired by you. It's what I'm really afraid of and what you're really afraid of is getting to the end of your day, to the end of your life, and having something left to give. Bear it! God, there's reasons to be resentful about your existence. Everyone you know is going to die. And there's going to be a fair bit of pain along the way, and lots of it's going to be unfair. It's like, no wonder you're resentful. Act it out and see what happens. You make everything you're complaining about infinitely worse. So you think, well, what do you do about that? Well, you accept it. That's what life is like. It's suffering. Put yourself together. And then maybe if you put yourself together, you know how to do that. You know what's wrong with you, if you'll admit it. You know there's a few things you could, like, polish up a little bit that you might even be able to manage in your insufficient present condition. And so you might shine yourself up a little bit, and then your eyes will be a little more open, and then you can shine yourself up a little bit more, and then it takes responsibility. And I think, you know, if you said to someone, you want to have a meaningful life? Everything you do matters. That's the definition of a meaningful life. But everything you do matters. So you're gonna have to carry that with you. Or do you want to just forget about the whole meaning thing and then you don't have any responsibility because who the hell cares? And you can wander through life doing whatever you want, gratifying impulsive desires for how useful that's going to be. And you're stuck in meaninglessness, but you don't have any responsibility. Which one do you want? Well, ask yourself, which one are you pursuing? And you'll find very rapidly that it isn't the majority of your soul that's pursuing the whole meaning thing. Because, well, look what you have to do to do that. You have to take on the fact that life is suffering. You have to put yourself together in the face, in the of, face, that. face of that. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet, don't look too good, nor look too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. If you can hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life for broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at the beginning and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are done and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 40 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. Get yourself together. Transcend your suffering. 
See if you can be some kind of hero. Nine life lessons. You might find some of this stuff inspiring, you'll definitely find some of it boring, and you'll definitely forget all of it within a week. One, you don't have to have a dream. Americans on talent shows always talk about their dreams. Fine, if you have something you've always wanted to do, dreamed of, like in your heart, go for it. After all, it's something to do with your time, chasing a dream. And if it's a big enough one, it'll take you most of your life to achieve. So by the time you get to it and are staring into the abyss of the meaninglessness of your achievement, you'll be almost dead, so it won't matter. I never really had one of these dreams, and so I advocate passionate dedication to the pursuit of short-term goals. Be micro ambitious put your head down and work with pride on whatever is in front of you you never know where you might end up just be aware the next worthy pursuit will probably appear in your periphery which is why you should be careful of long-term dreams if you focus too far in front of you you won't see the shiny thing out the corner of your eye two don't seek happiness happiness is like an orgasm if you think about it too much, it goes away. Keep busy and aim to make someone else happy and you might find you get some as a side effect. We didn't evolve to be constantly content. Contented Homo erectus got eaten before passing on their genes. Three, remember it's all luck. You are lucky to be here. You are incalculably lucky to be born and incredibly lucky to be brought up by a nice family that helped you get educated and encouraged you to go to uni. Or if you were born into a horrible family, that's unlucky and you have my sympathy, but you are still lucky that you happen to be made of the sort of DNA that went on to make the sort of brain which, when placed in a horrible childhood environment, would make decisions that meant you ended up eventually graduating uni. Well done you for dragging yourself up by your shoelaces, but you were lucky. You didn't create the bit of you that dragged you up. They're not even your shoelaces. I suppose I worked hard to achieve whatever dubious achievements I've achieved, but I didn't make the bit of me that works hard. Understanding that you can't truly take credit for your your successes nor truly blame others for their failures will humble you and make you more compassionate empathy is intuitive but is also something you can work on intellectually four exercise play a sport do yoga pump iron run whatever but take care of your body you're going to need it most of you mob are going to live to nearly a hundred and even the poorest of you will achieve a level of wealth that most humans throughout history could not have dreamed of and this long luxurious life ahead of you is going to make you depressed but don't despair there is an inverse correlation between depression and exercise do it run my beautiful intellectuals run Five, be hard on your opinions. We must think critically and not just about the ideas of others. Be hard on your beliefs. Take them out onto the veranda and hit them with a cricket bat. Be intellectually rigorous. Identify your biases, your prejudices, your privileges. Most of society's arguments are kept alive by a failure to acknowledge nuance. We tend to generate false dichotomies and then try to argue one point using two entirely different sets of assumptions. Like two tennis players trying to win a match by hitting beautifully executed shots from either end of separate tennis courts. By the way, please don't make the mistake of thinking the arts and sciences are at odds with one another. That is a recent, stupid and damaging idea. You don't have to be unscientific to make beautiful art to write beautiful things. If you need proof, Twain, Douglas Adams, Vonnegut, McEwan, Sagan, Shakespeare, Dickens for a start. You don't need to be superstitious to be a poet. You don't need to hate GM technology to care about the beauty of the planet. You don't have to claim a soul to promote compassion. Science is not a body of knowledge nor a belief system. It is just a term which describes humankind's incremental acquisition of understanding through observation. Science is awesome. The arts and sciences need to work together to improve how knowledge is communicated. Six, be a teacher, please, please, please be a teacher. Teachers are the most admirable and important people in the world. You don't have to do it forever, but if you're in doubt about what to do, be an amazing teacher. Even if you're not a teacher, be a teacher. Share your ideas, don't take for granted your education, rejoice in what you learn and spray it. Seven, define yourself by what you love. I found myself doing this thing a bit recently where if someone asks me what sort of music I like, I say, well, I don't listen to the radio because pop song lyrics annoy me. Or if someone asks me what food I like, I say, I think truffle oil is overused and slightly obnoxious. And I see it all the time online, people whose idea of being part of a subculture is to hate Coldplay or football or feminists or the Liberal Party. We have a tendency to define ourselves in opposition to stuff. As a comedian, I make my living out of it. 
but try to also express your passion for things you love. Be demonstrative and generous in your praise of those you admire. Send thank you cards and give standing ovations. Be pro stuff, not just anti stuff. Eight, respect people with less power than you. I don't care if you're the most powerful cat in the room. I will judge you on how you treat the least powerful. Nine, finally, don't rush. You don't need to already know what you're going to do with the rest of your life. I'm not saying sit around smoking cones all day, but also don't panic. Most people I know who were sure of their career path at 20 are having midlife crises now. I said at the beginning of this ramble that life is meaningless. It was not a flippant assertion. I think it's absurd, the idea of seeking meaning in the set of circumstances that happens to exist after 13.8 billion years worth of unguided events. Leave it to humans to think the universe has a purpose for them. However, I am no nihilist. I'm not even a cynic. I am actually rather romantic. And here's my idea of romance. You will soon be dead. Life will sometimes seem long and tough and God, it's tiring. And you will sometimes be happy and sometimes sad and then you'll be old and then you'll be dead. There is only one sensible thing to do with this empty existence and that is fill it, fill it. And in my opinion, until I change it, Life is best filled by learning as much as you can about as much as you can, taking pride in whatever you're doing, having compassion, sharing ideas, running, being enthusiastic. And then there's love and travel and wine and sex and art and kids and giving and mountain climbing. But you know all that stuff already. It's an incredibly exciting thing, this one meaningless life of yours. About two years ago, we were having a conversation and he said, you know you teach the secret to life is peak state versus lousy state or being energy rich versus energy poor, that a relationship, you can love somebody, but if the energy's low, it's not gonna show up, the energy's high, well, he said, what if you swap those words and you swap peak state for a beautiful state? I said, that works, you know, a high energy state is a beautiful state. Any state where your high energy would be like love or joy or gratitude or drive or courage or faith or, you know, playfulness or fun, any of those things are beautiful states. So he goes, yeah, yeah, I agree. And I said, and then suffering states would be low energy states. So that would be frustration, sadness, anger, resentment, loneliness, boredom, whatever. He goes, yeah, that's exactly right. So I, I can swap those. He goes, if you swap them, there's something cool that you might see or do. I said, what's that question? And he said, well, he said, I've made a decision that I'm gonna live my life where I'm gonna live in a beautiful state every day, no matter what, even if it doesn't, even if it rains on my parade, even if people do things that are unjust. And he said, the reason is because in a beautiful state, just like you teach a big state, everything flows. And I said, well, that's pretty much what I've been teaching. He goes, yes, but if you think of the lousy states as suffering states, he said, then you can end suffering just by ending the state. But I realized I didn't relate to suffering. Like if you had told me two years ago, Tony, do you suffer? I'd say, are you kidding me? I got the greatest life. I have the most incredible wife and four kids and I got 31 companies and I'm financially free and I have a mission I love and I'm in good health. And that would all be honest. I wouldn't have been dishonest about it. But what really helped me out of that conversation, I left there and I went, well, where do I suffer? And I realized frustration is suffering. I get frustrated. You know, I get concerned, I get pissed off, I get, yeah. you know, worried sometimes, I get these yeah. feelings. And so what I decided to do was, you know, just really create a 90 second rule for myself where I would end suffering as it arises. Because anybody tells you you're going to end suffering is full of crap. The reason is your brain is a two million year old brain and it's not designed to make you happy, it's designed to make you survive. Mm. But there's no saber tooth tiger for you to react to anymore. So now we worry about what are people thinking of us? Do I have enough money? Over the last two years, what I've done is play this little 90 second rule and if I feel tension in me, I go, okay, that's suffering. Where's it coming from? What am I stressed about? What am I concerned about? And what I immediately do is I realize the stressful thoughts, since I've seen Christian G, I kind of traded one thing. What I really do now is I dig in and I notice that the only time you have stress or suffer is when you believe a stressful thought. Because what are the chances of everybody doing exactly what you think they should do the right way every day? Zero. What are the chances of the people you love doing what you want them to do the way you want them to do them every day? Zero. What are the chances of you doing the right thing every day, even if you're talented and disciplined? Zero. Zero. So your happiness will never last as long as it's got expectation behind it. What I did was I began to realize 
I made the decision, it's the most important decision I believe of your life, that I'm not gonna suffer anymore. Life's too short to suffer and I'm gonna live in a beautiful state every day. And the way I do it is, I catch myself and I start to get that sense of stress. I let it go and I see the idea go by. So your thoughts, thoughts about this person messing up your business, you're not following through. If I was in a room with 10,000 people, I guarantee you 60, 70% of the business owners have the same thoughts at times, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. I ask people all the time, tell me your most stressful thought. Oh, I'm worried about my children, this may happen. How many people have had that thought? Everybody. Uh, I might not make a financial blah, blah, blah. How many have had that? Everybody. My point is, it's not your thought. It's the mind, not your mind. When you think it's your mind, you identify with it, and it's, you can't separate from yourself. But when you realize, these thoughts have been around for millions of years. And I'm just thinking the same thought that so many people have thought before. Like, how many people have ever thought, I'm gonna kill this son of a bitch? Now, you didn't do it, because you <laughs> didn't it. believe you're really gonna kill them. <laughs> but you felt it, you said it, you were there, right? So, we all have thoughts. It's only the stressful thoughts we believe that mess us up. So, what I try to show people is, if you can start to realize, these thoughts have been around for millions of years. If I told you a million years, you know, a thousand, a hundred years ago that we're gonna go to the moon and back, you called me a lunatic or crazy. If I said a hundred years ago, you're gonna have a little box like this, it'll fit in your pocket, and you can click on it, and you can see what the weather is any place. You can click on it and see a live person on the other side of the earth and talk to them by looking this box, and the way it works is invisible waves are traveling around the earth, and it pulls invisible waves in the box. You go like, read between the lines. There's no way, you dumb idiot, it's never gonna happen. <laughs> so what I want you to realize is spots are invisible waves. When you turn on a TV, it takes invisible waves, and depending on the channel, you're gonna see a love story, or an adventure, or a drama, or a comedy, or, or a horror. The way you use your body determines which of those thought waves come through you. One moment you're pissed off, the next moment somebody makes you laugh, you change your body, you change the channel, you change what comes through you. So what I've tried to do in this area beautiful state is simple. First, identify where you're suffering. What's your favorite flavor? Are you a worrier? Are you a pissed off person? Stressed, angry. What is it you do? Yeah. Second of all, decide you're gonna kill that monster while it's little. You're not gonna wait till it's Godzilla taking the city. You're gonna break the pattern. You start to feel the stress. You see it as thoughts going by, and then you focus on something to appreciate, enjoy, or love. Appreciation, love, and joy destroy suffering. You can't be grateful and angry simultaneously. It's possible. You can't be worried fearful and, and grateful simultaneously. So I tell people gratitude is one of the emotions to cultivate that'll destroy the suffering. We don't really know who we are, and I want people to admit that when they look at their books. The truth of it is, is that we really don't know who we are. We have many different selves. There isn't never one self. This is a concept that's very deeply ingrained in Buddhism that's greatly influenced me. Our self is constantly in fluctuation. We're not the same person we were as a child. In the course of a day, we have different moods. We have one self when we're with a lover. We have another self when we're with a boss, as I alluded to earlier. So to think that there's one consistent, stable self is an illusion. And neuroscientists have pointed this out. The brain tries to create for us this sense that we have a stable, consistent world so that we don't constantly freaking out about the actual chaos of life. So we even simplify ourselves into this idea that we have this one consistent, authentic self. Your authentic self is actually coming to terms with this chaos and accepting it and not trying to imagine that you're some consistent, great, do-gooder, moralizing person. And the other thing is you have a dark side. You have dark desires. You have aggressive impulses. You have anger. You have things that I call it the shadow. That's not me, it's a concept from psychology. You have a shadow side to yourself. Well, that's also part of being authentic and you've tended to repress it. So embracing the many different sides of who you are including embracing the fact that you're not nearly as good or moral as you think you are, actually would add up to be more authentic. Um, to ground yourself in reality, you would first have to ground yourself in yourself. You have to know who you are. You have to detach yourself from social media, from all the other influences that people are giving you. 
So when you don't know yourself, when you're not in touch with your own tastes and desires, your own impulses, what makes you different, what makes you unique, you are alienated from the one basic reality, who you are. And it creates, I think, a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression because we all have a, a deep need to sort of express our, our personal uh, opinions, our personal tastes, to find some outlet in some career, to give expression to what makes us different from others. And so if you're constantly listening to what other people are saying, if you're plugged in to the matrix continually, and that's your only reality, then really what you're doing is you're never understanding who you are. What you see when you look in the mirror is a reflection of all the other opinions that other people have. Opinions of you, opinions of politics, opinions of what's politically correct, of what's good and what's bad. You become a reflection of other people. And being alienated from yourself is a deeply, deeply depressing experience. It can lead to taking drugs, to stimulants, to all kinds of addictions. So we can say certain basic things about yourself. You, you were born very different from other people. Your brain is wired in a very unique way. Your DNA is unique. You are going to die someday. You're mortal. You have to fend for yourself in this world. People aren't going to give you things. This is sort of a basic kind of ground for your feet to sit, stand upon. And understanding that is sort of understanding reality. And a lot of people are fleeing from that because living in that kind of matrix world of social media and all the fantasies, you don't really have to confront yourself. You don't have to deal with your own demons, with your own weaknesses, with your own flaws, but you pay a terrible price. But I think the principal pro source of the problem is that people are running away from themselves. And on social media, that process is, deep, is greatly accelerated.